Viking Update Show on Talk North Podcast Network. I am John Krasinski. Usually, I am the talent. Usually, I am just the 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 guy who plays off of and catches the touchdown passes from Jim Suhan. He is not here. He is on vacation this week, and so we are delighted to be joined by Matthew Collar, entrepreneur, trailblazer media mogul um you know that is just about to take over this entire town and maybe the world um and matthew caller first time guest i think on the viking update show maybe i've had you once before i can't remember but uh yeah we've done this before you forgot to mention uh i'm part of the kicking competition as well uh, yeah training camp so i'll well, be doing that but what uh, could thank- go wrong for these yeah. vikings if you're if you're <laughs> out there kicking nothing could go wrong so no everything has gone great mostly with uh kickers throughout this team's history but i am thrilled to be on the show i do believe that i have been uh, a guest maybe once or twice before when you really got that itch for football and i've been thinking man i gotta get john on the show because we've had really good conversations in the past and every time i'm like oh what's he up to it's you know the wolves it's playoffs it's uh nba summer league and then team usa and i'm like there's just it never stops for you man no i i see i'm i'm so used to the nba season being over mid-april and then having a nice long summer but now it turns out when you actually cover a team that's actually pretty good uh the summer goes away quickly i'm not sure that uh this is what i signed up for but it's it's an adjustment (laughs) Very busy. We'll figure it out. But uh, we are going to talk here today about the Vikings setup training camp, talk about some very newsy stuff that has come out this week um, and get into a little bit of fun as well with Matthew Collar. We are brought to you from the Aquarius Home Services Studios by t- from by TSR, Twill and True Vision. And you'll hear more from those sponsors a little bit later in the program. But Matthew, let's just start it out right away here christian derisa big contract extension so much so that you did an emergency pod on purple insider uh yesterday about it um we're used to i think seeing the vikings have big signings i think leading into camp leading into mini camps and things like that but what struck you about this were you a little surprised that it came i saw you kind of tweeted that surprised that it came this early just what are your overall impressions of the Christian Derrissa extension here. I was a little surprised because they didn't have to do it right now. They could have waited until next spring or summer in the same way with Justin Jefferson, where they started the negotiations off last year and then put them on pause through the season, got back to it throughout the combine, the owners meetings, everything else. And then finally, before minicamp, they signed Jefferson as he was going into his fifth season. But with their saw, they could have waited until next year. They picked up his fifth year option. There wasn't a lot of pressure to do this. And normally we don't see players outside of someone of the caliber of Justin Jefferson or quarterbacks sign after their third season. Usually it takes after that fourth season, bigger sample size. Health is always an issue in the NFL. But with Christian Derrissaw, his last two seasons have been so outstanding at the position that he's a pretty safe bet. And overall, he's had good health. He has been a really big part of the locker room, the operation with the offensive line. I mean, you just see all those boxes getting checked from Christian Derrissaw that would say this is a franchise left tackle. And when we talk about positional value all the time in the NFL, you don't get far before you talk about left tackle. Because when you look around the league at all the Miles Garretts of the world, I mean, there's a lot of great edge rushers in the NFL And then you're going to have someday, whether it's soon or a little bit later, a quarterback in J.J. McCarthy who will benefit greatly from having a left tackle that can slow down the best pass rushers in the entire NFL. So for them, it was probably a no brainer as far as skill. But then they might have learned a little something after last year with Jefferson. I I think with Jefferson, if they had pushed the meter up a little, a couple of million, a couple of million more guaranteed, maybe they could have convinced him to sign last year. I'm not entirely sure about that because I think he always wanted to bet on himself a little bit and knew that even with an injury, the price wasn't going to go down for the NFL's best wide receiver. But still, maybe they were at the five-yard line last year, and a few more guaranteed millions could have got them over the hump, and they would have saved themselves a little money. I don't think it was devastating that they paid him 
five or six more million a year because of the amount that the salary cap went up. But if you think about with Darisaw and just where this league's revenue is headed, this will probably become a pretty good deal for them very soon. A few more tackles get signed and then you're going to look back a year from now and go, oh, okay, so that actually was the right time to do that as opposed to waiting another year. Then he you know, might make a Pro Bowl. He might rank top five by PFF again. And then everyone goes, okay, now pony up because he's about to hit free agency. And from Darisaw's perspective, someone slides you a piece of paper that says, sign here, you get $44 million in the bank account. Pretty hard to turn that down, I think. Uh, so good for all parties, but I think on a bigger perspective, it is a cherry on top of a very, very transformative uh, off season for Kwesi Adafo Mensa, where he really made this team his own. And now getting this guy locked up, you have pretty much all of your foundational pieces in place that if your quarterback is even pretty good, he is going to have a great chance to win a lot of football games on that rookie contract. Well, and also, Matthew, what I was, what I've been thinking about too, when you look at the logic of extending a year earlier than you did with Jefferson, let's say in two years, this thing goes to 18 games. Um, or, you know, right down the road, like all of a sudden you're going to have that more revenue that's coming in and, and that contract that you're locked into is going to look even more favorable. If, if it got, maybe, maybe that change won't come this soon and maybe it'll come down the road just a little bit longer, but it feels like it is good business for the team to lock in a player as long as possible, as long as you feel pretty good about the durability uh, and the, and the ability of the player not falling off. And the Darisaw just seems like a pretty safe bet on those fronts. Yeah, he most certainly does. He was drafted pretty young, I think 21 years old when he came out. He hasn't had any significant injuries. He missed a little time in his first year dealing with an offseason surgery, a couple of games over the last two seasons, as almost any NFL player would. Uh, but durability, his age, your projection with left tackles, it's one of the safest projections you can make because just historically, year after year, the great ones remain great. We don't ever go into a season and go, you know, is Trent Williams going to be good this year? They don't have as many factors as a quarterback that can impact their performance. They go up against great pass rushers every week. They either shut them down or they don't. And in the past, we saw a lot of don't. So when you get someone like Christian Derrissaw, you want to keep them for as long as possible. It is a rare bird in the NFL to have a left tackle who's young, but far enough along in his career that he's a technical player as well. He's just not relying entirely on his physical ability. And it's, it's probably one of the easiest positions and players to project in the league outside of just random injuries that you can't. Uh, you know, predict in, in any way. Uh, but to your point, getting it done early, the NFL is not going to make less money anytime soon. <laughs> you know, Peacock, Amazon, MySpace, LinkedIn, they're all going to buy football games and they're going to pay out the nose for them. Uh, the 18 game schedule will come eventually. And, and just that, but even if it doesn't come anytime soon, the salary cap has never gone down, at least as long as I've been covering the NFL. And even if you look back, it's actually quite insane. When the Vikings signed Kirk Cousins, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but the salary cap was something like 75 million less than it is right now. It is even over the last few years, it has just absolutely exploded. So the earlier you can get these guys done, the better off you're going to be in the long term. A lot of times it's difficult to get the player to sign. So the fact that Derisaw was willing to do this, I imagine Kwesi Adafo Mensa jumped on it, but it ends up being for him now, hey, I've put all these pieces in place. Now I've got to spend the the cap space that I've got for next year and fill out some of the pieces here that are still missing. But the hardest part is kind of done, actually, thanks to Rick Spielman with Justin Jefferson and Christian Derrissaw. But the hardest part is getting superstars, getting them locked up for long-term contracts, and then filling out the rest becomes a lot easier than it is to find a superstar left tackle. Right. And I did want to kind of touch on what you what you're getting at there in terms of Quasi Adolfo Mensa making it his roster or his team. This seems like an incredibly important season for him and Kevin O'Connell 
as they are, as they're trying to move forward in their regime and not just um, for the immediate future, but to maybe secure their long term futures here. I do think that when you draft a rookie quarterback and probably at least delay his entry onto the field with the with the Vikings, uh, whether it's for the full year coming up here or half a year or whatever, you buy yourself a little bit of time in terms of like evaluating where this roster is going. But at the same time, it felt like he quasi needed some sort of a little bit firmer foundation under his feet. I think that, you know, there were a lot of questions being asked and maybe there still are about where this thing is going, about his plan and his vision and his ability to execute it. Just what is your sense of where he stands within the organization going into this year and maybe, you know, what needs to happen for everyone to make sure that, hey, this is our leader going forward for the foreseeable future here? Yeah, it's a really interesting subject because when Kwesi Dafalmensa and Kevin O'Connell get here, the message from ownership was take the roster that we already have in place, add a couple of spices to it like Zadarius Smith and bring back Patrick Peterson and see if you guys can culture your way and maybe pass the football a little more than Mike <laughs> Zimmer your way into a competitive season for this group. Now they did that with 13 wins. We can talk about all the things that had to go right for them to get those 13 wins, but you can't take away what it says in the standings that they got a lot out of that group. Maybe should have changed defensive coordinators and so forth. You know, you can kind of go over that if you want, but the point being that they were competitive in the way that the Wilfs wanted. They did not want to tear it down like the Chicago bears or the Detroit lions did because they thought with Kirk cousins and with a lot of the, star talent that they were too good to do that and the standings proved that they were right but when you take a competitive rebuild approach which all of us kind of went what does that mean you know what does a competitive rebuild exactly mean it's like a guard forward like what position does this man play i don't know something in the middle and uh, what we saw was last off season that real process began when they moved on from about what five pro bowlers it was Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen, uh, Zadarius Smith, all these players kind of uh, Eric Kendricks exited stage left that were older, expensive, they were not going to ever get better than where they were, they were past their primes and they also the Vikings needed to get their salary cap situation right so they could do things like extend Justin Jefferson, TJ Hawkinson, Christian Derisaw and replace the old money with the new players money. Uh, and that's not an easy process to stay competitive when you are moving on from so much talent. And before Kirk, Killy, or Kirk Cousins' Achilles popped, they were well on their way to doing that. I mean, they were uh, they got off to a tough start and then the, a 500 team that probably ends up competing for a playoff spot at the end of the day if Kirk stays healthy. So you start to look at it taking shape there. All right, there's players like Josh Metellus or Ivan Pace who are emerging with opportunities. This is what they wanted to see. The salary cap down the road is looking good. But we still went into the offseason with big questions about can Kwesi Adolfo Mensa get this roster from point A to point B? Can he get it through? It's, it's not that hard to get rid of Delvin Cook or Adam Thielen, but can you get it through to the other side where we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel? And the first step to that was just not paying Kirk Cousins. If you give Kirk Cousins the deal he got in Atlanta, what are we looking at right now? I mean, what's the, what's the outlook for the future that leads you toward a championship? That would be really hard to find because of the fundamental question. How do we fill out the roster around his giant contract? And since he always took short term deals, the cap hits were always huge. Everyone probably already knows this song and dance already. So moving on from him, then sort of set off, I think, a domino effect of creating the cap space drafting the quarterback in a draft that they targeted from actually the time that they got here. They had looked into the future and said, our, our intel tells us that that quarterback draft is going to be very good. And it was, it was all time good with six first round quarterbacks. So they knew the opportunity was going to be there to pick from a very good lot of quarterbacks and then start the process of building around him. So now that we've seen the journey from when they got here to where the roster stands now, and this goes also with drafting you know, younger players like Jordan Addison that's going to be a foundational player or finding an Ivan Pace, like you need to do that along the way. 
But you can see now where a lot of teams have followed this same type of path with expensive stars around a rookie quarterback contract, complete rosters, and then you have to have good coaching as well, which I think they have with O'Connell and Flores. It's not there yet, but to get to this point where I think everybody in the fan base can see where it's headed and see the other teams, you could point to a San Francisco, you could point to a Philadelphia and say, or even, I mean, Detroit has gone through this a little bit with a little more tanking flavor, but the same sort of thing, getting these foundational pieces, you can look at it and say, all right, I see it now. I see what you were thinking from the start and I saw it come to fruition. That gives an air of competency for me is when they do exactly what they say and we can all look at it and you don't have to have an advanced degree in football to go, yeah, I can see where this thing is going. Uh, and I think that was huge for Quasi Adolfo Mensa because if he walked away from this offseason with a huge Kirk Cousins contract or missed out on a quarterback in the draft, or even I think I would have had more questions if they had traded three firsts for J.J. McCarthy or something. There was a lot of ways they could do this that wouldn't have made sense in my mind, um, but uh, they did it exactly how I thought they were going to, which makes me think that they've got a plan going forward. But of course, it's not there yet. And now the hard part begins of going from, Hey, everyone thinks you did the right thing, but now you got to make it work. And now you got to win. Right. <laughs> yeah. And th- th- one of the interesting elements that I have sort of observed from a little bit more of a far, whereas you're embedded in it and, uh, every day when Quasi Duff Adol- was hired, it's obviously advertised as this is, we're going down a different path. This is the the way that this guy does business, the way that he sees football, the way that he kind of plans and and his and his vision for leading is different from a Rick Spielman died in the wool scout, you know, football guy. And my impression has been that there have occasionally been times where the 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 newness and the died in the wool folks don't exactly see eye to eye or at least are adjusting to each other and trying to figure each other out and i wonder what your observations on that are in terms of the process of an organization that for a very long time was spielman zimmer like the prototypical caricature football guys kind of adjusting to this new way of seeing things that Quasio Adolfo Mensa brings to the table and how that whole process has gone to where it is today in terms of people being on the same page and just kind of seeing things as they are. Yeah, I think that you laid it out pretty well there that there was certainly a transition period. And now I am a believer in total draft luck that Mm -hmm. they could have traded down draft Lewis scene. He's the next Harrison Smith. The guy was the MVP of the national championship for Georgia. It's not like they picked some random from Akron state or something, but at the same time, that first draft blowing up in Kwesi Adolfo Mensa's face, I think hurt, just him in, in general, the credibility. He was supposed to come in and hack the draft and be this, you know, analytics genius, wild man who's, uh, you know, one step ahead of everybody else. But that's not realistic. Like, that's not real. You t- the other GMs earn their jobs as well. And they have the internet as well. And they have researchers and they have analytics people. It's not like, Billy Bean baseball, where one guy did things so much different than everybody else. It's much more closer to what baseball is now. The NFL has gone through its analytics revolution, and most teams understand a lot of the same concepts. So you're really looking to win kind of around the edges and also with uh, organizational functionality, if that makes sense. If you can have everybody tugging on the rope in the same direction within an organization as the leader of that organization, the GM position, I think you've got a lot better chance of success than if you have a lot of people thinking we should do this, we should go that way. And then you end up with dysfunction, kind of like at the end of Zimmer and Spielman, where every, it seemed like every draft pick that Spielman made, Mike Zimmer didn't want that draft pick. And those two weren't talking to each other by the end of that thing, where I think we've seen O'Connell and Kwesi Mensa and the Wilfs all have the same 
overall idea and concept to work toward. And that was, as we labeled it or he labeled it, competitive rebuild. But we're talking about somebody who had very little experience by comparison in a leadership role. In fact, almost no leadership experience at all, which is a very hard thing. It's sort of like if you work at the McDonald's in the back and then they make you the manager and tell you to make everybody schedule and balance the books and all those things. It's, you're going to be over your head to start. And, and I think that was the case with Kwesi Fomensa. And had he crushed that first draft, then everyone might have had a little bit of a different perception of him from the start. But there has definitely been the growing pains along the way. And I think what has guided it is just the overall idea. Well, one is that Kevin O'Connell is a culture mastermind. And we say it all the time, culture, culture, culture. You hear it. Everybody mentions it. But having seen up close how he relates to people, his treatment of the players, their response through the NFLPA survey, that's been another thing that, that I think has been huge for them is to have O'Connell, who has been in the NFL for a, a long time, for his entire life, basically has been in football. So there's a little contrast there. And I get the sense that they had different viewpoints on a lot of things, one coming from a data background, one coming from, hey, I played quarterback in the NFL and won a Super Bowl as an offensive coordinator perspective. But I felt like this offseason was really important for everybody in the organization believing that Kwesi Adafo Mensa could get the draft pick here, get the extensions done. If we were talking about right now, Justin Jefferson not being signed, you and I might be having a little shade of a different conversation. I'm like, I'm not really sure on this. And, and Rob Brzezinski's huge on that, as you know, as well. It's not like they have one man leading the whole thing. But I think that he needed this offseason pretty badly to get the quarterback that his head coach liked. And that whole thing of them going and meeting with the quarterbacks and sitting down with them, I think, was big for Kwesi Dalfomensa and Kevin O'Connell to be on the same page. And now... We look at the McCarthy pick, the direction that they've taken as they are hand in hand here going forward, leading the organization. And it feels it feels very competent to me. That doesn't mean it's going to work. As you know, sometimes draft picks don't work, uh, but it feels very much like we've got a plan. We're executing that plan together. And we didn't know that necessarily for sure going into this offseason. We're talking with Matthew Collar from Purple Insider on the Viking Update show. Uh, we're going to step away for a break for just a minute here. And when we get back, we will talk about quarterbacks, obviously. We'll talk about Duke Shelley. We'll talk about a few other things. But first, I want to tell you about Chu Vision Institute in Bloomington. I am going this week to have LASIK surgery. I've been wearing glasses my entire life, pretty much since fourth grade. And I just got to a point where it was time for me to explore ditching these things and really just be able to wake up in the morning and be able to see things. That sounds really good without having to have anything to put on my face. And so the people at True Vision in Bloomington have been amazing, stuck the process. They were, they have been patient. There's a no pressure approach. They took me through a bunch of very exhaustive testing. Um, and to, to really determine what was the right direction for me to go to correct my vision. And after about a month, month and a half now of kind of navigating through some family issues and other things, we're getting ready to go in and have the surgery. I'm really excited to go through with it. I trust the people at True Vision implicitly to take care of my needs and to uh, kind of walk me through every step of the way. And I can't recommend True Vision enough. If you go to TrueVision.com, you can get a consultation set up. They will take you through the paces and they will show you what is right for you not for anyone else, but to come up with the right decision for you. And I can't wait to tell you next week how all of this worked out, but I have complete confidence in True Vision in Bloomington, TrueVision.com. And now we'll hear with from a few other sponsors that uh, support the, the Viking Update show on Talk North. 
Scott for Aquarius Home Services. Making your life better is a huge priority for us at Aquarius. It may start with providing worry-free water or heating and cooling systems you can trust, but there's another very important reason. Aquarius is family-owned and operated. We work hard to earn the right to be recommended. That means upfront, no surprise pricing, providing a five-star experience, and treating your home and time with respect, and knowing we're just a click away at AquariusHomeServices.com. I want to let you know that I went into Twill recently and had the best shopping experience of my life. I got everything I wanted. It all fits me perfectly. It took me about 10 minutes. If I hadn't been in a hurry, I would have lingered and talked more and and enjoyed the experience. But I was in a hurry this one day, in and out 10 minutes. Uh, What you should know about Twill in, in the Dining Galleria, Twill by Scott Dayton, is they just started their summer clearance sale. 40% off seasonal items. This place doesn't have many sales. It's not a discount shop. They sell stuff that they expect to last you the rest of your life. Uh, So if the sales are relatively rare, you should take advantage of them. I highly recommend Peter Millar, Johnny O, Brax. Uh, Those are the things I wear the most around town. And it's fantastic stuff. It's not going to wear out on you. It's not going to be something you need to replace in a year or two. It's stuff that fits perfectly. So check it out. Go to twillmn.com. Sign up for their email list. They will not spam you. They'll just tell you about events like this. And 40% off stuff at Twill, you're basically getting incredibly high-end stuff at discount prices. I highly recommend it. Twill in the United Galleria, twillmn.com. We also want to thank our friend Steve Terry and TSR Injury Law, sponsors of this show, sponsors of the John Krasinski Show on the Timberwolves on this network. Uh, great guy, great company. They have gotten a lot of money for deserving clients. They will not charge you unless they win your case, and they win a lot of cases. That's why you see Billboards all over the city with Steve Terry hanging out with Nas Reed. It's a great alliance. Uh, we really enjoy that. So if you're ever injured, just remember 612 TSR time, 612 TSR time. All right. We are back with Matthew Collar from Purple Insider on the Viking Update show. And this week, Matthew, and really for, for much of this summer with the, uh, with the Vikings lean up, we're always going to be in, you know, just completely enamored with quarterback. Of course, you have a new rookie shiny toy coming in. I have found it interesting, Matthew, how steadfast and I want to almost say defiant Kevin O'Connell has been in his messaging about how this is going to go. You get the impression that he has been in positions, Washington, that um, he has seen how it goes poorly and how it could go the wrong way. And he is absolutely certain that the Vikings are not going to be sort of either bullied or pressured into rushing J.J. McCarthy out there until he is absolutely ready, whether that means week one, whether that means, uh, you know, week one of next year, whatever it is. Uh, they have their plan. They're going to go about it. But my whole impression is it is all geared toward this is going to be a longer term project for JJ. Let's, let's not rush anything, get it out there. And even if Sam Darnold doesn't play great, we're going to kind of hold the line here. What do you, what do you think about the way that Kevin O'Connell is sort of messaging things going into camp here? So I use the word defensive. You use the word defiant. Yeah. I see that we both picked up on the same tone from Kevin O'Connell about not rushing JJ McCarthy. And for one, I would say to Kevin O'Connell, uh, maybe I will when I see him around. You don't have to defend it to me uh, because right. we have seen through NFL history, recent NFL history, how important it can be to let a quarterback develop. And you don't always have to bring up the Packers, but it's, a, you know, no, maybe no surprise that uh, Jordan Love, after a couple of years of development, gets in and by the second half of the season, they're ready to pay him $55 million and so forth. And we've seen many quarterbacks over the years, Sam Darnold included, get thrown into a situation where they were in over their head. If you go back and look at that Jets roster, you have to wonder how the heck did they think a 20 year old was ready to take a hold of a team that wasn't in great shape there offensively, didn't have the best offensive coaching and, and then just say, Hey, just go figure it out and be our franchise quarterback. That's a lot to ask. That's not to say that Sam Darnold's issues are always uh, and entirely based on Todd Bowles, Adam Gase and Matt rule and, and being pushed in too early. But 
he was not ready for that early in his career and may have developed some bad habits because of it. And Kevin O'Connell is very, very serious about not letting that happen with J.J. McCarthy, who is the youngest quarterback in the draft, only through, I think it was 714 passes in college, which is one third of the amount that Bo Nix or Michael Penix got to throw somewhere in that ballpark or Jaden Daniels, these other quarterbacks who come out at 23 or 24 years old that have had a lot of development under their belt. And I still see that, you know, someone like Drake May is not starting training camp as QB1 either. So I think a lot of teams have gotten maybe wise to this at the same time. And and I, I think that his words are very much genuine, that he wants to do everything he can to make sure that J.J. McCarthy is fully and completely locked into his offense and ready to go the first time he steps on that field so he can be confident and throw the ball in the right place and play in rhythm and play on time. Uh, well, there's one of it, one thing that's maybe a little comparison to you because you have kids. Uh, sometimes you can't protect them from everything, right? Sometimes you got to put them on the bus, let them go to school. Right. The other, the other thing is too that, and maybe this is an unfair comparison. You can tell me last year, Nick Mullins threw four interceptions in a game and Kevin O'Connell threw his hands up and said, Jaron Hall, you go play. Yeah. And I know Jaron Hall is not the same type of merchandise as JJ McCarthy, but. Everything is different when you are in the pressure of the season because there was no real reason to play Jaron Hall. But yet every one of us was kind of thinking, all right, well, yeah, just play Jaron Hall. I'd rather see the inexperienced guy. And then he gets slaughtered in the first half of the game and you go, oh, maybe you shouldn't have done that. And maybe he wasn't ready like you thought he was. And maybe the pressure of losing a game like they did against the Lions with four interceptions was overwhelming and shaded his viewpoint on going to a quarterback who wasn't ready. I'm not predicting this. I'm just saying that words in off seasons are very, very easy to say and much harder to execute. At the same time, I talked about organizational competency and having everybody on the same page. And I haven't gotten the sense from anyone that there's any disagreement on this approach. And that even comes from media Fans, ownership, everyone looks at J.J. McCarthy and says, this is a guy who is very, very talented and very, very inexperienced. So get Josh McCown, get Kevin O'Connell, work with these guys as long as it takes for J.J. McCarthy. And if Sam Darnold has a rough year, then Sam Darnold has a rough year. Or if J.J. McCarthy over the next six weeks is really good and looks like he's ready to go, then play him. Play him the day he's ready to go and no other day. And if you got to bench Sam Darnold for Nick Mullins, we'll all forget about it. This is one thing that happens all the time in sports is we just forget about stuff that happens that doesn't really matter that much. Oh, Sam Darnold got benched for Nick Mullins and everyone on ESPN declared J.J. McCarthy a bust. Well, three years later, when he's starting and throwing to Addison and Jefferson and leading the team to being really good, well, we won't remember that everybody said that at the time. So I would say to Kevin O'Connell, A, you don't have to defend it to me, and B, make sure you stick to it. Even if it feels horrible at times, and even if it looks bad at times, and even if everybody is criticizing you for not putting in McCarthy, and even if the fans are chanting, we want JJ, then... You still just have to go with what you think is right. And the ownership has to make sure that they're not picking up that phone and saying, hey, uh, Kevin, is it time to maybe play the rookie? They have to believe in him and understand that he knows best on this as well. And uh, they shouldn't be pressuring him if they get frustrated because there's going to be some bumps with uh, Sam Darnold. To me, expectations could loom large in this season with that because I do think a lot of teams feel the pressure not necessarily to win immediately by throwing a Sam Darnold out there with the Jets or whatever but it's we have to show we got the right guy and we're going to build on it quickly and we're and we're we're, we're going in the right direction that way if Darnold stumbles out of the blocks in this season it's what do you expect out of the Vikings this year? Do you expect them to be in the playoff conversation? Or are you, are most people maybe not outside of like uh, a, a certain segment of the fans who are just going to tear their hair out no matter what? Is everyone okay with, hey, we might be a six-win team. And th- that may be better for the long-term future with our salary cap, with our 
draft picks, with with all of that stuff. And we're going to take our lumps right now. Or are they going to be in a situation where it's like, gosh, you know, the rest of the North is good, but no one has really separated themselves yet. We can still be in this. Let's go to JJ a little quicker to see if we get that that bump, that 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 juice from someone. And that to me, that is going to factor into how they make that decision. And right now, like you said, right now they're saying, no, we're going to hold our water. Everything is going to be, we're going to do this the right way. But when the bullets are flying and games are actually being lost in the middle of the season, things can change quickly on that front, especially when you're a head coach that does not have a contract extension and you're a GM that does not have one yet. That's going to be just interesting to see how that pressure works with or against this. Well, and it might be wise for them to work on that. Uh, we have not heard <laughs> anything so? on that front, but it is important that at the ownership level to understand that the NFLPA anonymous player survey put this team at yeah. the very top two years in a row with this leadership and they gave their head coach an A plus. So if you look at the process which I, I don't love to say that because the sports people say it constantly and it starts to mean nothing like culture. But the, the process of having a head coach who can lead a locker room the way that Kevin O'Connell can, but also understanding that this is going to take some time would make me say, give him an extension, give him job security. Don't put so much pressure on him to win right away with a, a situation that is being competitively rebuilt around a quarterback who is vastly inexperienced. The NFL does not work this way, though. In fact, we have to point to one or two examples to say, hey, you know, Cincinnati wrote it out that one time with Marvin Lewis and it ended up uh, paying off with Andy Dalton later on or Mike Tomlin, where Pittsburgh has stayed with him for so long. But there's not all that many situations where we see a team just say we're locked in. We believe in our coach and hell or high water, bad breaks or good breaks. We're going to stick with him because. When you lose, it is hellacious in the NFL. Uh, with baseball, with basketball, the team is bad, and then it's this sort of slow drudgery to the end. In the NFL, when you lose, it is like the end of the world every single week over and over and over and over again, and you get destroyed by the fans and the media and the national media and everyone else. And one of the things that people love to do is call for jobs. And, and sometimes it just becomes hard on even an ownership to block all of that out and say, we believe in our guy. Uh, I'm not saying this is going to happen to Kevin O'Connell. It's just if you extend this group and say that we're in a, a really good place here and we want to stay on this path, I think it takes a little bit of that pressure off because if they do kind of ride it out with the extension, then that puts this year more under the microscope. And I don't want this year under the microscope if I'm those right. guys because they, they've they made this whole transition that they were asked to do by the ownership. And as far as this year's expectations go, that's actually a hard question as well. Because if you win five games and draft the best dang cornerback in the draft, that could feel pretty good. Uh, but if you win five games, that means a lot of stuff went wrong. I mean, that means that the Darnold experiment went horribly or McCarthy wasn't ready and, and played badly when he got in. It probably means that players that you thought were going to be really good, like Jonathan Grenard, Andrew Van Ginkle, Dallas Turner, were not as good if you're losing that many games. Maybe maybe Will Reichard, your rookie kicker, missed eight game-winning field goals, but probably not, right? More likely than not, if you win five games, everything went wrong for your entire team. You don't want that outcome either. But the wild card here is so much the quarterback position because if Kirk Cousins was playing quarterback for this team, I think we would both say it's probably a 10-win team, 9-win yeah, team. It should true. be right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they are with Sam Darnold if he starts the entire season because I've seen Jeff George and Case Keenum come in and throw it. Well, yeah, I was a kid with Jeff George, but you know what I mean? The Case you Keenum, can't claim Jeff George. You weren't here, Collar. You can't claim him uh, with us. Well, okay. I But but <laughs> I was a Madden junkie at the time. And there do you, you know what Jeff George's arm rating was? Oh, yes. You can, you can, I, I can claim Jeff George, you I think. You can sling that thing. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but the point just being, we, we've seen around the NFL, and Geno Smith is a good example of this, 
even Baker Mayfield last year. If you give the right circumstances to talented quarterbacks, you can get better results than those quarterbacks have ever gotten before. And I believe that Kevin O'Connell has the resources and the offensive scheme to help Sam Darnold be a much better version of himself than he's been. But can I tell you that they'll win 10 games in this division? If they had a garbage division, then I could say, oh man, I could definitely see it. They don't. They have a great division. And Chicago, you know, is much better than they were even a year ago now. So it's hard to set the bar because I can't say, oh, if they win five games, it's cool. It'll be a good draft pick. Draft will be fun for us. Well, that's, that's not what the ownership wants. And I don't think that's fair to the fans either because they have so much star talent. And if you're the owners, you just wrote a check for 44 million for Derisaw after writing a check for whatever insane amount of money for Justin Jefferson. And you're going to listen to the coach say, well, guys, it's okay if we win six games. It's not. And the, and that was Mark Wilf told us that at the owners meetings directly because we asked that same question to him. Well, how are you going to be patient and so forth? And he said, no, my expectations is that we're in the playoffs. And I think that's where we should set the bar is take this and show us that you can make quarterbacks better or that these supporting casts and all the players that you've drafted and paid for and put together and your scheme can all work, even if you don't have the veteran quarterback. But that is going to be a difficult task when you look at their schedule. A couple more minutes here with uh, Matthew Collar from Purple Insider here on the Viking Update Show. Um, Matthew, I really enjoy how you kind of go about this media landscape and try and look for unique angles and things like that. One of your recent pieces, you went um, Ubering in Ann Arbor and tried to, you had an idea and you think, this could be really cool. Um, I'm going to try this out. And it turned out to not really work um, all that well. <laughs> But I was really impressed because there are a lot of people who would have this idea, say, I'm going to go to Ann Arbor and I'm going to take Uber rides around and just talk to the drivers about J.J. McCarthy and see what kind of stuff I can glean from it. And then if you go and you don't get like this super rich, great, you know, examples, you might just punt on it and not write anything at all. But I like that you wrote it. I like that you took us through a little bit of a journey with it and you laid it out. Just what what were you trying like? How did that kind of come about and what was the decision making process on? You know what? I didn't get the goal necessarily I was looking for, but I'm still going to like lay this thing out there and just give give my readers a little bit of a of a glimpse into the process of of being a journalist here. This uh, article idea came to me in 2021 because I was in Cincinnati for the Vikings opener and I was working on my book Football is a Numbers Game by yes. Amazon. Or uh, I, I was told it's in some local Barnes and Nobles if you want to go find it there. Good anyway, plug, plug, so yeah. I was so I went to Cincinnati a little early because the book is uh, surrounds around pro football focus. That's where their offices are. I was there for three or four days and I didn't rent a car. I just Ubered around everywhere. And every Uber driver I was with, I, I mean, every single one wanted to tell me how great Joe Burrow was going to be. Every one of them I had because it. Maybe you've been to Cincinnati before. It's a long trip from downtown to the airport. I had a guy take me through all the NFL quarterbacks that he would take Joe Burrow over on the Uber ride out to the airport. They were so obsessed with Joe Burrow that I put it in the back of my mind. Someday I'm going to ride around with Ubers in a different city and ask people what they think of whatever. And this was the opportunity. We're in a little bit of adult time. I don't have to go out to TCO Performance Center, you know, for a few weeks there. And I thought, okay, thank you, Sun Country. I don't know if they sponsor your podcast. They can certainly po- sponsor mine. Some, some easy trips out to Detroit. And uh, so I flew out there and thought, I'm going to take Ubers around Ann Arbor. It's a college town. Everybody knows J.J. McCarthy. They just won the national championship. And everyone is going to want to tell me how great he is. Or maybe they'll tell me, "Ah, you know, the real deal on him. Because these people know. The locals know stuff that people Mm -hmm. outside don't. And what I ran into was one gentleman who drove players around and had good insight on J.J. McCarthy and saw him working out at Shem Beckler Hall last year. And we had a really good discussion. The rest of them, maybe not so much. <laughs> in fact, that was the only guy who I could get to talk football with me. And uh, one man in particular wanted to tell me about 
how climate change was going to bring the end of the earth. And I should Mm -hmm. start preparing my bomb shelter now and how he already had one in Montana and uh, that he, maybe he's right. I don't know, but that was, uh, that was a pretty wild conversation. I think everybody could probably relate to that where you've gotten an Uber and there's something there that you didn't expect. It was a really fun piece. I can't say that I brought home new insight on JJ McCarthy, but there actually, I will say this, John. I don't think that there is new insight on JJ McCarthy. I, he is exactly what he is. He's a football obsessed kid who's never wanted anything else but to be in the NFL and has handled his life every step of the way. What's going to get me closer to being a national football league star quarterback? And that seems to be his singular focus, which I can't argue with, but nobody came back and said, Hey, let me tell you the real story on McCarthy. Uh, but it, it was a fun trip. Nonetheless, and Ann Arbor is a beautiful town. I love that you took the swing. Good stuff. Um, we will get to Duke Shelley next time. We will get to a few other things next time. But uh, Matthew Collar, appreciate you taking some time uh, uh, on a busy week here and getting ready to start this thing in earnest tomorrow, right? That's uh, as, as we, Today, I, I'm headed out there this yeah, afternoon. There we go. But there I, we go. whenever people are listening to this, I'll have already done it. There we go. I mean, amazing. So go to Purple Insider, purpleinsider.com. Listen to his podcast. Read his book, Football is a Numbers Game on Pro Football Focus. Thank you to Aquarius Home Studios, TSR, Twill, Chew Vision Institute. Thanks to our producer, Davide Rosso. I am John Krasinski, and we will speak to you next week. 